I've got two jokes here. I don't know if I should read both of them or just one. I'll read the first one. My brother came back from school all, mo all motivated because he said he would be following a, a new diet from that day. We didn't really give it much thought until my brother really started eating his homework for dinner. When we stopped him and asked why he was doing that, he replied, I was just trying to see how it tasted because my teacher said that the homework would be a piece of cake for me. Once a mosquito walked into a clinic, the doctor saw him and asked him what the matter was. The mosquito said that he had a lot of problems. He wasn't happy with his life. He, he was not happy with the job he was doing. He was sad. He had no motivation. The doctor listened to his problems and told him that he should really visit a therapist instead of a doctor. And the mosquito said, yeah, I know. I just came in here because you have blood in here. <laughs> Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, having been entrusted with this word to bring it to the family in this in this house today i just pray that you'll pour an anointing on the word that your holy spirit will accompany it and then it will follow into our hearts and uh, there it will reside so that, to the effect that we might be better for you lord in jesus name amen so the sermon is about god's grace a secular definition of grace is the unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification, a virtue coming from God. These are secular definitions, by the way. A state of sanctification enjoyed through divine assistance. My first grade experience with the word, I never heard the word grace before I was in first grade. And the nuns taught us to say the Hail Mary prayer. And I think I was saying that prayer for about a week, maybe two weeks before I realized that it wasn't Hail Mary full of grapes. Because the rest of them were singing Hail Mary full of saying full of grapes. And I was singing Hail Mary full of grapes because that's what it sounded like to me. And in my mind's eye, I was picturing this woman sitting at a table with a big bowl of grapes in front of her. And since it said full of grapes, my picture with bulging cheeks and grape juice and grape seeds running down her chin. That's what I was picturing. And I said that prayer at home and my dad, who was Catholic, he said, no, no, it's not grapes, it's grace. <laughs> well, I couldn't see what grace looks like. I was five years old. I didn't know what grace was. So what is God's grace? What is it? It's the unmerited favor of God. His favor of kindness towards us, which we don't deserve. God rains down grace on all mankind, a verse says. He gave us the beauty and wonders of nature that we see every day. He often brings us just the right thing in just the right time. We've all experienced that, just in a nick of time. And he also gave us an inner conscience to know right from wrong. All these things are common graces and everyone born on the earth has the benefit of them because God so loved the world. In that verse, God so loved the world, you can put your name in there where it says, it, God so loved Woody. God so loved Clyde. God so loved Lori. You can't put your name in there because you're part of the world. Before I believed in the Lord, 
God bless me with these kinds of graces. Beautiful sunrises and sunsets, moments surrounded by God's glorious creation in nature, trout streams that were full of fish willing to take my fly, fun, laughter, and fellowship with friends. You know, I experienced the grace of healing when I was, well, I guess I was 20 years old. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 14. That's a degenerative disease, you know, it's incurable. My brother-in-law's had it for probably 40 years and he's had a lot of his joints replaced a second time and he's a cripple. And I had that and sometimes I would go to school on crutches, hobbling around, would be in my knees one week and in my hips another week and my shoulders another week and my fingers another week. I even had it in my jaws. It would always be like parallel and it would move around like that. I remember one time, that one week my dad had to get me out of bed. I couldn't stand the weight of my body on my, my knees. And he walked me back and forth in the room a couple of times before I could get going. Well, praise God, I don't have rheumatoid arthritis. So God's grace blessed me with that healing, even though I wasn't a believer. My mother was. So I like to say that I was healed on credit <laughs> because I would be a believer. But that's a healing. But it, when I was 20 years old was the last flare-up that I ever had of rheumatoid arthritis in California after we got married. God is good. He also lured me with thoughts that there is something more in life something beyond the notion that God is good. He convicted me. He showed me that I needed a savior and that there is only one. Just being born on this planet includes many benefits. But when I became a believer in Christ, I got even more benefits from God's grace. In fact, believers are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm because we are united with Christ. Six specific areas where God shows us grace. The first one and the best one is God's salvation grace. The grace that Jesus purchased our redemption with his own blood on the cruel cross of Calvary something that we commemorate once a month in communion. God's grace forgave all our sins. That's something we need to stop and reflect on from time to time because sin separates us from God and earns us a reservation in the lake of fire. But he forgave all our sins. God's grace it's an immeasurable gift given to us when we believed. We didn't work for it, and we didn't deserve it. We deserve perdition. If he stopped there, that would have been enough. But he continues to give us even more grace, kindness, wisdom, and understanding. John chapter 3 starting with verse 19 or 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. God is so amazing. God is so good. 
There is no blessing to equal salvation, to equal being set free. There's no blessing to equal that. And another one is God's continuous grace. This is in Romans chapter 7, starts with verse 15, where Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. That was Paul's struggle common to all of us. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin who living, uh, sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind I'm a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Paul was in a dilemma. And this dilemma that Paul describes is common to all believers. When we get saved, we abandon the pattern of sin that ruled in our lives. But we are subject to continuing attacks of the enemy of our souls termed as fiery darts. We become a target for temptation. When we get saved, we give the devil a black eye. And he doesn't take that lightly, so he comes after us with a vengeance, with temptation. And he's sneaky about it. Put something in front of you that he, he knows what our weaknesses are. And once we conquer that one, there's another one. We go through life that way. If you're honest, you will admit, you will agree with me that we go through life that way. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we need to examine ourselves continually to make sure that we're in God's will in our thoughts and our words and in the things that we do. Ask God to shine the light of his word into every part of our life. But if you don't read it, then you don't have access to it. We all need to have a daily Bible reading. I read a one-year Bible every morning, it takes about 20 minutes. And at the end of the year, I have read the entire Bible. I'm on it for the 25th time. And you always find something new in it. Oh, I never noticed that before. I underline, I take notes, but we need the light of his word to shine into every part of our lives. And we need to pray, show me Lord, where I may be failing you, show me. And then we need to listen. Then his grace applied to us will forgive us. God's grace. God's forgiveness grace. Not only are all of our sins forgiven, when we repent, 
but we gain a godly ability to forgive other people of the offenses that they commit. God helps me and you to forgive little offenses, big offenses, and even previously unforgiven ones. Forgiveness is possible even when the offense caused extreme hurt. There are examples of people forgiving other people of murder. Jesus himself said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he forgave them from the cross. He forgave them in his agony. This kind of forgiving grace doesn't take away from the depravity of the offense, but it does provide an atmosphere where the offender can repent if he chooses. Forgiving grace requires the strength of God because if I'm left to my own thoughts, revenge or vengeance might creep into mind, and that's a sinful attitude. Forgiveness is usually a God-ordained thought. God gives us grace to forgive. And the next one is God's new grace. Each morning, I have the glorious opportunity to begin again. Each moment, actually. <laughs> if I made mistakes yesterday, I can start over with a clean slate. Every new day, every hour, every breath is a chance for me to act better and display more of the fruit of the Spirit. Because of his presence within me, I will always have opportunities to think and to do better. And what's better? More pleasing to God. Instead of thinking only of me, I can show concern for others. Instead of being full of anxiety, I can be full of peace and joy. I can wait with patience. God's grace gives me the self-control to act with kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, faithfulness, and gentleness. And the next one is God's freedom grace. God gives me the freedom to forget about what other people's opinions are. I need to know God's opinion, not what other people think. I can learn to be the person that God created me to be. I don't need to impress other people. I just need to be faithful to the one who created me and he already loves me. I am free to be who he wants me to be. Some people say, well, I'm a free spirit. They mean they're free to be who they think they should be. No, I'm free to be who he wants me to be. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made with a purposeful design. Getting to know God through his word helps me to know my purpose in life. Better said, his purpose for me in this life. And when I know it, I can go ahead and live it. If the sun sets me free, I can be truly free. The next one's God's future grace. God promised to be with me at all times. When I say me, I'm talking about all of us. His Holy Spirit will counsel me and prompt me as I go through my days. He's with me in each present moment. And those moments lead to a glorious future. Even when I go through trials, and I will, He's there to help. He's there to help me get through them and make the environment around me better. Jesus said that here on earth, I will have many trials and sorrows, but I can take heart because he has overcome the world, John 16, 33. The unknown is easier to go through when you have a hand to hold. That's grace, the feeling that I'm never alone. 
Always remember that grace is a gift. You can't earn it. You get plenty of it. It's free and it's abundant. When you go to God in heartfelt prayer, he will always give you what you need. Forget about worrying about getting what you think you deserve. That's not the way it works. Grace is getting much more than you deserve, but it's what God wants you to have. Amen? Amen. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God's grace is sufficient. And this verse reaffirms that God's grace is big enough to cover every area of our life. Many times it is easy to want to compartmentalize sections of our lives from God. God's grace covers everything. God's grace fills in the gaps where we fall short and make mistakes, which we do. That's great news. God is not concerned with perfection, but he's concerned for us to grow each day depending on his grace, depending on him more. God's grace shines brightest in the broken places of our lives, and we've all had them. and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ, Romans 3.24. Despite our age, race, or socioeconomic status, God's grace does not discriminate. God's grace is available <clears throat> for everyone who repents and accepts Christ as Lord and Savior. Through Christ's redemption, of our sinful humanity. God's grace abounds and is overflowing. In the midst of our sin, God's grace still covers, strengthens, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Grace is available for both the saved and the sinner. The purpose of God's grace is for Christians to grow closer to him recognizing their human limitations. <laughs> we sure have a lot of limitations, don't we? Next thought is we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are, Acts 15, 11. God's grace is an essential component for everyday life and foundational to the Christian faith. We need God's grace to sustain us every day. Within our own strength, we'll make mistakes daily. Within our own strength, we just can't conquer much of anything spiritually. God's grace reassures and reminds us, reminds us to depend on God more. We're not alone in receiving God's grace provides an opportunity to glorify him more. Grace fills in the areas where we fall short, Let us say, letting us know that it'll be okay. God's divine nature intercedes with our human frailties. And the fourth in this row of thoughts here, the fourth uh, verse, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. For 1 Peter 4.10, God's grace is present when we serve and use the specific gifts that God has called us to in various capacities. As humans who fall short, we will make mistakes daily. I'd probably make them hourly. <laughs> and God invites us and encourages us to be faithful stewards of God's grace. 
as we interact with others in our homes, workplaces, ministry, social settings, we are to extend grace to others. God's grace is extended to us, and we are to also extend the same grace to others. To some of us, that's hard to do. But just do it. We're to extend <clears throat> grace to both ourselves and others when shortcomings take place and welcome opportunities to start again. God's grace covers various behaviors, attitudes, circumstances, and people. The good news about God's grace is that it covers <clears throat> any scenario. Next thought is, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. That's James 4 and 6. There is no shortage of God's grace. And there are no circumstances where God's grace is not available. When we drift away from God or become too prideful, God's grace invites us to draw back closer to him. The good news about God's grace is that it is an open, free invitation to start anew. God does not give grace from compulsion, but it originates from God's great love for his children. Despite how far we may stray away from God, his grace does not dry up and is always calling us back. It is only the grace of God that I can say that I'm a sinner saved by his grace. And we can all say that. It's only by the grace of God. It's only because of God's grace that I can rise above being bogged down by people's offenses, by hurts. It's only because of God's grace that I can partner with the Holy Spirit to bring the holy light of the gospel into dark places. We live in a dark world. The grace of God helps us to carry this word into the chaos of the world. We carry the message. We carry the gospel. God provides the grace. Amen. Talking about grace today. We've all had grace. We've all had the grace of salvation. Some of us got saved twice. <laughs> I did. Carol did. We went away from the Lord. I went, I was going, I was out for three years. I came back on my knees with tears flowing. <clears throat> and God said, oh, he said, I won't strive with you again. This is your last chance. She was out for another seven years. And the ladies of the church prayed her back in. On Sunday night, I'd be down at the altar, and Jane Grove would come up to me, put her hands on, on me from behind. She said, I'm praying for Carol. I want you to know I'm praying for Carol. She, has, she was an organized prayer warrior. This day, she prayed for this, and this day, she said every, I think it was every Tuesday or every Thursday. And we prayed her back in. But it was God's grace that, that did that. We prayed, but it, it wasn't us. It was God's grace. And I'm sure you can all give testimony about how powerful and how awesome and how free and how forgiving God's grace is. Amen? Would you stand? You know, this is a day like no other day. Every day is. Every moment in time is a place in time where we've never been before. We've never been here in time before. God owns the time. He created it. He keeps it going. 
He won't always keep it going. There's a time when time, there is a moment when time will be no more. But it belongs to God. The world belongs to God. When he's had enough of it the way it is, he's going to come down here and straighten it out. It's going to be amazing. God's grace. Awesome thing. Lord, we thank you today for the believer hearts that are in this place today, Lord. We thank you for all the families uh, that they represent. Families and neighbors and co-workers and friends. And we ask, Lord, that you would provide a grace so that they would be affected by the gospel. That our unsaved loved ones, Lord, would come to Christ before it's too late. We pray for that today in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for this church and that we're still surviving. We thank you, Lord, for all those that aren't here. Let's get a grant traveler's mercies. And um, even though life is hard, Lord, you are good. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.